you on the sofa. That's it. Welcome to Ask Girl. This is where we answer the most interesting health and fitness questions that we can get hold of and also the questions that you write in. Now with me today we've got Dr. Hota who specialises in health but also in how he can com combine um, the intervention of pharmaceuticals and lifestyle advice for his patients. We've got Yulia who combines um, herbal medicine with lifestyle advice to treat her patients. We've got Chris who is a nutritionist specialising in uh, childhood obesity and behavioural changes. Now what we've done is uh, we have set, set across, or I've set a few questions in different rounds. And what we're going to be doing first is answering these questions collectively. Is that her? <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> I read some of these questions. I just read some of the questions. Some of them are pretty provocative. Yeah, they put on Instagram live as well. Um, so, uh, these questions are more just to, to warm up, they're to stimulate conversation. Uh, so, it's whoever wants to talk. So, first question is. If there was no emotional attachment to food or body image, would this change how you communicate with your patients? Very, for me, it would be. How so? Just very slightly, I think sometimes when they have an attachment in terms of the way they look or they enjoy their food that much in a certain way, then you have to approach it just very differently. Yeah. Um, you may have to like talk to the parents very much and get on board with them and see what the issues are. Or you may have to talk to the child individually yeah. and see what their issues are around food or the way they look, and then maybe get those outside agencies in if they need to be, but, and um, speak to them and see how you can work together to help that individual. When it comes to a lot of the barriers that you see to people uh, dedicating themselves to a healthy life, if you were to sway, if you were to put a percentage on what's mainly down to a lack of knowledge and what's down to a lack of emotional control, how would you sway it? Oh, knowledge is definitely, for me, it's one of those, what I see a lot of is knowledge. Mm -hmm. They just don't understand certain things, the aspects of health, like which we try and promote as students to get fit, health and nutrition, and try and get them to understand it as best they possibly can. And the amount of kind of questions you get around it, which they you think, oh, they, you think they would understand like what basic carbohydrate is. Yeah. Yeah. They go the whole opposite way. And we'll understand where a fish finger comes from. Do you think that differs between adults and children? Uh, at this moment, yeah, yeah, probably. How, how so? Well, some adults just are very obscure to what good nutrition is at the moment. Yeah. They just buy one, get one free, and that just is going to feed their family, which is absolutely fine. And that's the, the kind of gist of it at the moment, but it's not understanding the right nutrition to go along with it. That, that kind of healthy balance. How about you, Doctor? Does that come into your line of work at all? I mean, all the time. I mean, obviously, I, I do the diabetes clinics and I promote the kind of low carbohydrate. Uh, you know the diet, but most most patients, you know, uh, women more so than men, do have an emotional attachment to food. Whenever you're stressed out, you're anxious. Uh, you know, particularly you're going to eat the sweet foods, the salty foods. So most people, very few people, do not have an emotional attachment. And those people that don't have an emotional attachment, they probably look after themselves anyway. They're more disciplined or are in control. So I think there's very few and far between. You know, including myself. You know, if I'm stressed out. Think, you know, yeah. the, the bad foods come out, you eat, so yeah, it's important. And But I suppose what's more important is how emotionally attached they are. The greater that attachment to food and reliance on when you're stressed out, then you know you've got to work on those emotions more than giving the advice. So you could give advice, they could, they could understand the advice, but if you don't deal with the emotions first, mm -hmm. you're not going to have any success. Mm -hmm. How about you, Julia? Counseling and um, so behavioral counseling comes into place as well in holistic uh, medicine, lifestyle medicine. Um, a lot of it, I think, is to do with how we're raised as well, how we're taught to deal with em emotions from children. You know, if you um, if the parents are away all the time, and as soon as they come home, they bring sweets, and that's a treat. And you know, if you do something good, you get something sweet. Just conditioned that way. Hundred percent. Doesn't yeah. mean it can't be changed. Um, but yeah, we have to be delicate as practitioners um, when it comes to speaking about food and um, body image and all, all of that. Probably make it easier, you know, if we didn't have to, obviously we're human beings and we, mm, we have yeah. to take that into account. I, to I totally agree with you there about how we're uh, programmed, you know, you know, within the Asian culture and things like that. You know, there's lots of kind of sweets and things like mm. whenever you pass an exam or anything, all the kind of Indian sweets come out, well done, had this, you know, and, and especially within the Asian culture, um, in fact, being slightly overweight, for them that's healthy. Mm. And it's really, and as soon as you get to a kind of normal weight, 
Oh no, no, that's that's unhealthy. Yeah. You need to. Yeah. So I totally agree with you about how you, you know you treat kids. So it's it's very the knowledge is important to mm -hmm. try and get out there to to families. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I, I wrote an article once in the paper, and I really like the line about you're killing your kids with kindness. Yeah, absolutely. If, yeah, and a lot if a lot of parents understood that, really, really understood mm -hmm. that, they would you know rather than you know go up to school when they're picking their kids up, and you've got the crisps and the chocolates there. You know, it's you know I know they're hungry, nuts or whatever. You know, yeah, yeah, exactly. Of fruit, something like that, just something absolutely. I'd say that point's key is the emotional attachment to food, but what kind of emotional attachment to food? Because if you're you're talking about reward, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Reward or to bait your kids or killing your kids with kindness. You, mm -hmm. if they're upset, you give them a sweet. If they're happy and they've done something well, you give them a sweet. I've also, I was talking to someone recently, and they said that there was a, a, a drastic cultural shift after World War Two, after the rationing in the UK, and uh, when food started to go into more mass production, food was readily available. Apparently, that might have had something to do with uh, why we are now at such a uh, in an environment like such a calorie excess mm -hmm. in comparison to what we were before. Next question. If you were to give your patients or your clients one book, what would it be? It's hard for me like being working with kids because I, oh, really I don't really want to really give children them book. <laughs> it, could, it could be a child's book, but it's a child's book of whatever they fancy. I wouldn't want to make them go home and read a specific book on mm -hmm. exercise. Exactly, yeah, I'd rather just give them Harry Potter and tell them yeah. to read and enjoy it. More than from my, that's from my perspective. I, I mean, I'm, there's loads of books that I can recommend. I don't know about any one particular book. I'm, I'm a big fan of Michael Mosley and yeah. what he says. Um, um, yeah. Well, he's one, of, he's one of the kind of the, the TV doctors, mm -hmm. uh, and he's got a very good book. Him and his wife wrote a book, uh, The Eight Week Blood Sugar Diet Recipe Book. That's a, that's a very, very good one. There are a few others. That, and be, because he's quite popular and people relate to him, I probably would go for any book written by Michael Mosley because he also talks about you know intermittent fasting and all these other things. So yeah, I'm probably a big fan of his really. Nice. Yeah. How about you? There's a really interesting book I've read recently, uh, a bit con uh, sort of contradictory or you know interesting to to discuss. Definitely, it's called You Are the Placebo. Um, so what's it called? You are the placebo. Yeah. yeah. Making your mind matter by Dr. Joe um, Dispenza, who's a chiropractor and a neuroscientist as well. And it's I think it's quite fascinating to to read both from a practitioner and and patient point of view, and it's quite um, gives a lot of tips of you know how we can tackle, for example, epigenetics. That's a big subject that's come you know, come up recently, and. Um, Basically, you have your DNA, but that's not your destiny. There are certain genes that can be turned off or on depending on you know the environment, your diet, and stress, and, and so on. And um, that's one one way um, that we can change. You know, basically, you can make yourself yourself sick, or you can make yourself recover better um, if if you eat. You know, if you eat well, and also if, if you spend more time in your parasympathetic nervous system, for instance, a lot of people are in overdrive, um, very stressed if they don't rest properly, and then it kind of messes up your, your body's balance as well. Um, meditation is, is one example given in the book. Um, it's very helpful for you know um, just being healthier, really. And can I yeah? Can I add to that? Yeah. yeah. The anxiety I'm finding more and more. I'm seeing more and more patients with anxiety. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, be it'd be nice to kind of talk about it more fully, but kind of very bri briefly, a, a lot of my patients, what they do, you know, the anxious patients, they're on overdrive, and everything they do, in fact, puts them into more of an overdrive. So, for instance, they're on overdrive already, but to cope, they drink more coffee, mm -hmm. uh, which st stimulates them more. If they're asthmatic, they start using their Ventolin inhaler more, which again increases your heart rate. Mm -hmm. Then they, they go to a gym and they do a HIT class rather than do a yoga plot class yeah. to calm them. So everything, yeah, everything they do pushes them more towards the thing and then they end up with palpitations and things that we don't slow down and we don't rest enough. And what you were saying about placebo, the mind is like powerful. And I'm sure over the years I've seen many patients where they've, they've not been ill, but because they believe they're ill. And I believe that they've actually caused an illness through their own belief. They believed it so much that they've actually you know, yeah. not brought it upon themselves. Yeah. Just, yeah. and if you think of, uh, what was it, 1990s, um, when they discovered that 
you can actually, if you activate some neural pathways, and you, you know, um, you can actually increase the number of connections in the brain. And, and in three weeks, if you don't use certain parts of your body in emotions, they can also be reduced. So that will speed up or slow down how quickly you produce cortisol. Oh, yeah. yeah. Don't fight over there. <laughs> That's adrenaline. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's another way you can explain it as well, but yeah. definitely I've seen it in my personal life and in my patients' um, lives as well, but anxiety can really cause physical symptoms yeah. talking and of, meditation can talking about reverse them to up to a point. Talk about the placebo effect specifically. I think the placebo effect a lot of the time is not well understood. And I think the, it's so important that the placebo effect is, is controlled. Uh, when trying to create um, evidence or whether to find evidence supporting or not supporting an intervention. But the, the, the history of the placebo effect, it, it was kind of culturized to, to create a perception that um, it's all in your mind. And that can be true for sensory problems. So I'd say like pain is a sensory problem, right? Pain can change depending on what kind of mood state you're in, depending on what day of work you've had, etc., etc. But when we're seeing the placebo effect actually have an effect on structural problems like cancer or a tumour, that's something entirely different. And there's a really good TEDx talk, um, I can't remember what her, what her name is, but she was basically saying that the placebo effect is being driven into more of a parasympathetic, parasympathetic uh, state. And that when you go to a doctor and the doctor talks to you or another health practitioner and they talk to you calmly and they put their hands on you um, and they reassure you and they fully examine you and they say everything's going to be okay, it apparently puts you in more of a parasympathetic state. And um, that is where obviously healing yeah. occurs yeah. Uh, or it obviously is a spectrum. When it comes to complementary medicine and all sorts of therapies and yoga included, it's been dismissed you know quite negatively in a way but if we can learn to use it positively as you say you know just the way you are with your patient or you know it's in sort of certain religious sort of communities if you know the tribe is praying for you often you know they, they just feel better and as you said you probably rest better your heart yeah. rate goes down and your body is able to you know work on its healing better um, and then there's the nocebo as well which is interesting you know some people who um, Perhaps they, they think a certain medication is harmful or they heard someone had a side effect from it and they take it and then, then they might have that experience, that side effect, even if it's not one that is related to the medicine and it's come across. Actually talking about the placebo, so I recently did a talk about lifestyle medicine to the GPs and following me there was a, another GP and he's from uh, uh, Eastgate Church here and they do kind of faith healing. You don't have to be Christian to go there but uh, the, and they uh, accumulated the evidence but and there's some of these patients aren't Christian who, who go there but through the, the faith healing the the positive um, news they give you the support I mean they claim lots and lots of things where people have been pain for many years and without medication just through faith faith in whether it's Jesus Christ or whatever they've managed to come off painkillers and and you know the evidence he was was true they you know that they, they audited it really well so this placebo, this faith, belief, mm -hmm. it works whichever mm -hmm. way. And was you earlier to tell me about, was it knee surgery or the study they've done? And loads they, of surgery. Yeah, yeah loads of surgeries. Surgery. Mm. They so, just open you up, they do nothing, so you back up and then it's... Surgery is, in such, <laughs> surgery is in such high demand, it's in huge demand because of how powerful people think it, think, people think it is. So surgery and injections are deemed to be one, some of the most powerful intervention so the more invasive the intervention the more powerful and they compared um, meniscus surgery or knee arthroscopies um, with exercise rehabilitation and long term no change um, and that's not placebo effect either. that's not comparing placebo that's just comparing intervention but they did compare brain surgery to remove uh, brain tumours against placebo as far as I'm aware <laughs> as far as I'm aware there are identical outcomes uh, between the two studies and there could be a whole variety of reasons why that is. Um, obviously, the placebo effect would be one of them. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's interesting. Mm. It's, that, it's that definitely interesting. And that book is full of all mm. these case studies and trials. Yeah. And, you know, when it comes to medications, yeah. or how difficult it is for 
um, the pharmaceutical companies to compare something against the placebo effect because obviously. Oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's very difficult because yeah. some one person believes more than the other. Mm -hmm. yeah. You give four or five people a placebo pill, one really, really believes in it, and the other one, you know, you may not believe mm -hmm. in it, and that's hard to think. But believe, you know, placebo and belief is is really important in all of our jobs. Even with you mm -hmm. dealing with the children and stuff, you make them believe that they can get fit or they li they can lose weight, and you know, it, it it helps. They've got to believe in themselves to kind of warrant going forward. Yeah. If they don't believe themselves, yeah. Well, there's negativity around it. They're never going to succeed. And I think if I can push that boundary of them really believing in themselves, mm -hmm. they're going to succeed no matter what. I mean, I saw a child today who was who came to my group about three years ago and has changed so much. She does gymnastics now, she is constantly eating healthier with her mum, her mum's changed her lifestyle. Mm. might not be necessarily down to me, but the way her habits now have changed is yes. phenomenal. She's just such a completely different child. Mm -hmm. And that's really young. She's now year three, I think, mm -hmm. and she was year one at the time. Mm. And it's amazing. And the consequences of that are going to be, I think the consequences of that are going to be bigger than a lot of other possible medical interventions. Because you're talking about changing someone's lifestyle for the benefit of their mental health, their self-esteem, their social health, they're uh, less likely to suffer from Alzheimer's, vascular dementia, heart disease, diabetes, liver disease, like it's just, the, the benefit from, from having that base, a healthy base, healthy lifestyle, are huge. Mm. Um, Chris, this question is for you. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, you've got to leave this sorry. question, because it was getting heated before, okay. um, before Dr. Sorry and, and Yulia arrived. Right, if you were to eradicate Terrorism or obesity. <laughs> terrorism or obesity. Or terrorism or what predisposes obesity to so fast food, sweets, etc. Katie's taking a sip of a coffee, she's leaning to get some. <laughs> which would you which would you eradicate? Terrorism or anything that predisposes obesity? I wanna play purely devil's advocate on this. No, you can get involved in this because I wanna get involved, I'll get involved from devil, devil's advocate perspective. I think what That's my point, is that when you do bring in advertisement, when you do bring in the person's family background and the family habits um, and their lack of education, how much choice do we really have with how big we get and how obese we are and how, exactly. how little we exercise? Because in my opinion, I don't think we have that much of a choice. I think that you could show me 100, you could show me a thousand parents and I could quite easily come up with uh, a, a statistic or a figure as to how heavily I think those children are going to be predisposed to live in exactly the same way as their parents. And when you don't have that choice, how much does, should the government govern? That's like, that's, that's my point. Um, me personally, if I was in charge of the government, I would 100% crack down far more on fast food. I'll crack down on fast food advertisements. I would, um, I would. They're already in, they're already doing that. Yeah, good. Toys, you know, so, yeah, so it's there's things like that. Well, McDonald's actually target the kids. They don't target the parents. That's why you've got Happy Meals and. But the, the problem with a lot of this is, you know, with a, is it brings in money for the country. Exactly. I mean, when I was on the, you know, I was, I was talking about the Kenton Health and Wellbeing Board, mm. I spoke to the, the guys who own the local leisure centres here, Cascades and Signets. Um, and you know, I, used, I take my daughters swimming there and obviously you see kids swimming they come out and firstly they go to the fast food machines and they, yes. obviously you know right. they've done some exercise kids have, yeah exactly and you know, so I said I said to the, uh, you know speaking to the leisure center guys who are, you know, I said can we not get rid of these machines and the answer was it brings us in money that's crazy you okay, so know it's and, and it's the same with the hospitals so you can go to Darren Valley Hospital now uh, you can get all sorts of operations, your stent done, you can have a bypass and things mm. like that. Now, come out and then you can have your Mars bar, you can have your chips and things mm. like that. And within seconds, you're now already clogging your arteries up. It doesn't, you know, the NHS has just spent millions and then in the same hospital, you're being dealt crap food and then you can go mm. out and access more crap food and you're creating mm. an environment, it, 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 but it brings in money. Mm -hmm. you, know? you can't even, you there's no VAT on fruit and veg. You can't yeah. add a value added tax to fruit yeah. and veg. Be, unless you freeze it, <laughs> you can't. But you can add a value added tax onto obviously fast food. Um, but yeah, no, that's that's the point that I wanted to address in that question: is to how far you go with the nanny state. Do people really have a choice? Do they not have a choice? The lifestyle that they lead. Right. Discuss. Then what we'll do is we'll limit each of these to two minutes. Okay. So the first question. You're actually, time these. Yeah. Okay. The first point. To, the first point to discuss. <laughs> Is that recorded? Yeah, it's recorded now. <laughs> health, health is an in, sorry, health is an individual responsibility. Lifestyles that promote ill health 
is an individual problem and an individual consequence. Starting That's summarizing what we were saying, you know, mm. ideally you would be more of a community responsibility, but the reality is it's down to the individual, you know, families and uh, parents, mm. yeah, really, and friends yeah. and partners to actually educate themselves and make and informed choices. And, yeah. Would you say the same, Dr. Yeah, I totally agree. Mm. Yeah, we all need to kind of work together. Mm. The reason why I ask this question is that when people come into us, to lose weight, they view it as very much an individualistic problem, mm -hmm. i.e. I put on weight too easily, mm -hmm. I make all the wrong decisions, I, I don't choose to eat the salad when I, when I should do, etc, etc. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, when you've got these huge companies that are moving into developing countries, for example, like where my family is from, Jamaica, and 50 years ago, you would not see one overweight person in Jamaica, and now there's loads of them. Because it's a human problem, because it and because it's, it's not an individual problem. What, what, so I know we might have run over the two minutes, but one of the reasons I'm so passionate about the obesity, child obesity, everything, it links with everything, you know, with social care and things like that. So these same children that are obese who are going to end up ill health, they're going to need social care. So all the social care system, unemployment, unhappiness, it's all linked. Mm -hmm. The whole society level, it's, everything is completely linked to this one thing. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I know, it, and I think if we could try and help this one thing, so many other institutions, other, you know, society could benefit. That's why it really, you know, it's really important to focus on that. And it has to be as a society, we all need to get together and do it. Cooking yeah. classes, many more cooking classes. Cooking classes, yeah. Indian eating. Definitely the national curriculum. Yeah. It should have been the national eight, curriculum. You know, traditional Indian but how many kids know how to cook? Healthy. I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? You, don't, you ask a child to cook. Yeah. Of just anything or yeah. get involved with in cooking parents and parents don't, don't, cause you know, parents don't cook. But they don't cook, but they also, when parents cook, they don't actually involve their children in yes, absolutely, so yeah. absolutely. Whenever they're cooking, whenever we start with like a fussy eater, for example, yeah. the initial thing that I do is to say, right, go cook with your mum. Yeah. Yeah. Go That's enjoy cooking, yeah. go yeah. feel the vegetables, go smell them, see yes. what they feel like before you actually take them out of them. And they're a lot more likely so, to actually eat Exactly, yeah. 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 So if you people don't like broccoli, why? Because you've never felt and smelled and before. They should, only, and they should grow them as well, have a little... Yes, absolutely. Little That's even yeah. better. Mm -hmm. Definitely yeah. a little Watman. Next topic to discuss. I'll take this up. Next topic to discuss. <laughs> National health is getting worse. In, 20, in 2,218, we can expect. Well, it, I mean, look, I'm always uh, an optimist, and we have to change the tide. If if I if I think negatively, you know, it's it's not going to help anyone. I'd like to send out more of a positive message that we're going to reverse the tide of obesity, uh, levels of dementia, heart attack, and stroke are going to go down. People are going to be educated more. They are they are going to learn to cook, and we are going to get children into growing. Schools are going to change where, and GP surgeries are going to change where it's more going to be concentrating on health and well-being. As, as in schools as well. Any of them? Yeah. Coming up, yeah. I think that going full and agreeing with you, in that you have to be an optimist, uh, or at least it, the, uh, being an optimist points the way forward. I think that the, when you look at history, historically, the biggest changes come when um, there's either a financial incentive, a power incentive. Um, more than an ethical incentive and I think what we'll start to see is I think we'll start to see tech developing to a point where insurance companies can start to uh, charge people a lower premium for being at a certain weight or a certain activity level. I think we'll start to see employers uh, being able to audit their staff and deciding who they want to take on dependent on how likely they think they are to claim sick leave. Um, and I, I think that will probably be the trend for And I think if that happens, and there are there is already um, interventions that are starting to go down that path, and there's already tech that is in development uh, to make that more seamless, if that's the case, I think there will be a financial, a, and a career, and a um, self-progressive incentive to stay fit and healthy. And I think that's when things will change quite a bit. Yeah. Get points. Yeah, no, it would be a point. I think um, Booper are already doing that. If you exercise a certain amount, or if you go to the... No, that's it, Nuffield. If you no, go to Nuffield, the... Nuffield. That's what I was telling you about. And that's why oh, I, of course. I was saying, yeah, I was telling you about Nuffield, the more you go, the lower your insurance. And that's what almost... 
I think GP surgeries, the way forward is, you know, if you can, uh, you know, exercise and things, as the NHS said the same philosophy, mm. you get your prescriptions free or you get, uh, you, know, you know, there'll be benefits on the NHS mm. if you prove that you were, and tech could be the way forward. Smoking's one of them that's already yeah. Yeah, puts your premium right yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lewis Atkinson's got another question for you, Doctor. He asks, um, what are you, what's your opinion on, on heavy focus on liquid diets for the treatment of type 2 diabetes? I don't, I, I don't favour them, to be honest. Uh, I think they're hard to uh, maintain long term. Food, when I, when I talk to people about real food, it should be eaten as real food. Totally. Liquidising things. You know, a lot of people, you know, we talk about innocent smoothies. They're not innocent. They're, so much, they're loaded with sugar and, you know, and the body absorbs that. Green smoothies, not so bad, maybe, but you know, a lot of people don't like the green smoothies. Yeah. But that, the liquid diet doesn't really work. I, I don't know. Just, you, instantly go back to your old habits of eating again as soon as you eat again you put more weight on so yeah. you eat the less amount of calories you might as well eat just a smaller portion yeah. and whole of food like you yeah. said and you'll instantly lose weight as long as you're exercising and being healthy in the long term there's no need really yeah. to have a, a shake every day for you just need to go to the basics go back to yeah. basics yeah, yeah, definitely it's because and i think it is i'd agree with both of you and i think it's because people don't know what the basics are that prevents them from Going back to the basics. And then you come back to education. education and yeah, everything. exactly. Um, the other thing that is to at least um, recognise is that diet adherence correlates to initial motivation. So if people lose weight very quickly, mm -hmm. um, they tend to adhere to a diet in the long term better. Um, so I suppose the right way forward... Well, if you look at that, that's probably like Slimming World, isn't it? And like, yeah, like, well, it does. Exactly. Yeah, so it does as, a, as a company, mm, yeah. they, are, they kind of design it so that you're really, really successful, but what everyone else seems to always go back. It's come back. down to habits. So, right? As yeah, soon so as you finish the programme, it's even worse. Exactly, and then you go back to where you were beforehand. So I think there you're more paying for the support. Yes. I yeah, think yeah. the support that helps you there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, more, than it, more than the... Diet itself. Association yeah, yeah. with other people going like to the journey together. Like yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you could time travel um, to 1818 and you could change one thing for the benefit of public health, what would you change? Any any time, like literally any time after 1818. Anesthesia for women, giving birth, no more bleeding, dying to death and dying so, in pain. That would be nice. <laughs> 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 There's been so much suffering. <laughs> I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even think of the answer to this question or it's been. I didn't look at that one. So think, biggest predispositions to being unhealthy now, so we've got the influx of sugar and the influx of um, food and mass production. How would you amend those? You could tell the Native Americans that the Europeans are coming, then you couldn't have mass, <laughs> <laughs> then you couldn't have mass sugar plantations. That could be a good one. I think it. I mean, it begins with uh, after. Obviously, it begins with McDonald's and McDonald's story. Mm -hmm. You saw how quickly they saw the profit. Mm -hmm. and then you know, it all starts with uh, you know, the Americanization of the food industry and everything. If we could have stopped that, yeah, I think it would have made a massive benefit. So you'd give very crocker salad. Hey, <laughs> you'd give very crocker salad. <laughs> <Yeah. Croc> salad <laughs> to, <laughs> to eat healthy. Right. Next question. Can I trust? Okay. These are common. These are common concerns that I've. Um, had a look on uh, Quora, which is a website for questions, and obviously what we've heard before as health care practitioners. And I've got an answer which I feel would summarise both of these, but I'll go into that after. Yeah. <laughs> can I trust herbal medicine? Alright, don't know me. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Right, can I trust herbal medicine? So it comes down to you know, where you're getting your herbal medicine from, in what circumstances, are you assessed proper, properly, you know, is this prescribed safely, looking at all the other medications and, you know, taking a full health history or are you just buying something off the internet because you read something or you heard someone um, recommending it, which can be, you know, very unsafe, there have been many cases, unfortunately, um, you know, where often they can't even find the ingredients uh, in a particular herbal product so you know we valerian and there's no valerian in it or there is uh, B steroids in some Chinese creams or you know all sorts of things so you, you have to make sure that you I say when, when it comes to herbal medicine in the UK I would say you, you should see a medical herbalist um, then you make sure 
make sure that you're seeing the expert, someone who's got you know, a Bachelor of Science degree in herbal medicine, who has studied you know, pharmacology, is trained in the same diagnostic skills as a GP actually, which not, not all people know about, um, and you're being monitored. Um, same with any medicine, you know, you should, you should have regular contact with a practitioner, uh, make sure that it continues to be safe, that it's effective for you and um, you know, taking into account anything else that is going on in your life then. So I think, yeah, you can trust herbal medicine. Um, definitely it's very effective and safe and, you know, taken in the right way and adjusted um, accordingly, definitely. And it's, you know, it's, as humans we've evolved uh, alongside plants, uh, we've used herbal medicine for many thousands of years, we've, we've survived the species. Um, you know, doctors used to have a lot more training in herbal medicine, there would be um, apothecaries, they would use um, herbal products more. Um, so it's taking what's still useful from traditional knowledge, combining it with um, the current uh, research into it and the current clinical evidence and experience and you know, making it, um, adjusting it to the needs of our current society we are. <laughs> Kalashos Pharmaceuticals. Well, Me? Uh, yeah. I mean, there, there is a, um, a lot of uh, problems going on in the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, if you can have noticed that a lot of patients come in that their tablet size and shape has changed because the, the pharmacist whoever is buying it cheaper from a different source. I mean, they're supposed to be all MHRA approved and hopefully they, you know, the regulations authorities do do what they should be doing uh, and I'm hoping that they said but I don't like and I feel sorry for patients I'd say it'd be myself as well that you know you, you're used to a brand and it, you know you you take the body doesn't react to it and frequently you do find patients where the brand has changed and it's actually the same drug but they still they're reacting to it so what are they reacting to mm -hmm. something so that's my answer Hopefully you trust it, but sometimes when the brand changes, things do happen, and you should ask your GP to go back and prescribe you the original brand. I'd say it definitely goes down to what, what both of you discussed, and, and that's the emphasis on the individual. That is down to the individual doctor, it's down to the individual uh, medical herbist or nutritionist or osteopath, etc. Not the practice, but we see a lot of people coming here, and I'm an osteopath by trade. They'll say osteopathy didn't work for me last time, or I went to see a chiropractor, but I didn't like it, etc. And that's not the chiropractor, that's not the, the, the discipline, it's the individual. And I think, but then that makes it even more difficult because you expect a certain uh, professional qualification to standardise everyone, but it doesn't often, does it? Especially when it comes to herbal medicine, which is not um, regulated in the UK, then the risk is a lot higher, obviously. So, you know, I'm part of the National Institute of Medical Herbalists. Uh, we sort of self regulate ourselves, but we maintain strict standards. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's the problem. When things aren't regulated, and that's when it gets yeah. out of hand. Yeah. yeah, which is why you need to be more careful yourself. Yeah. Chris, I want to lose weight, but I'm too unfit to exercise. You're never too unfit to exercise. Everyone's got to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. people, people start just walking down the street. That would be a really good initiative to get going. Um, I think find a local gym, find someone or a friend, find someone who would want to do it with you. Find a grab a partner and just start moving. The more you can do, the better. As long as it's in line with a healthy lifestyle and you're not just going for a, a mile walk with a friend, coming back and then going, right, should we have fish and chips? <laughs> it's just not going to work like that. You're better off just not doing anything. So grab a friend, go find a find someone to do it with, have fun with it, make sure it make sure it's fun. You've got to have fun with your exercise. Do you if think it's not fun, it's, there's just no point in doing it. Do you think sometimes, do you think people have, um, they overcomplicate exercise sometimes? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Because so they, they, I mean, one important thing that you said is that as long as you're moving, it's exercise. Or to be yeah. better you, like we, as an initiative, don't we? We say you have to do 30 minutes a day every day. Mm -hmm. People don't do 30 minutes a day every day. They do it for every every other day, and then maybe do four out of seven a week. But if you can stay in line with government standards, you're going to do it. Very well knowing that moving more reduces your likelihood of uh, of falling, especially in old age. And this guy just from getting him to squat and walk around his house, uh, the fact that he can now stand up from a seated position without using his hands. And he's, he's somewhat sharper mentally, um, he's, he's more talkative, and as well as that, he, he feels a lot more comfortable in his own. Um, right, let's get through these last couple of questions. My children are getting bigger. I tell them to stop eating and moving, but they don't listen, what should I do? I've got 
five minutes. Of yeah, they will practice on five minutes. Give me a call. Huh? Give me, Give a, me call. a call. <laughs> no, no, in all seriousness, probably um, in terms of them and their weight gain, I'd go see a, so go see a GP first, get measurements done. Um, maybe go see a dietitian, get referred, and then they can then refer you to maybe see me, and we can get you into any groups that we've got available here in Dartford or in Gresham. I need by example as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely, the yeah. children are like sponges. They they follow what you do often. So. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, when I was giving the talk to Do the GPs, you, I was yeah. saying to them, like, you know, you can't preach diet and exercise to patients if you're not, sitting yeah. there and you know you're not yes. fit or. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can't have. I, I couldn't do my job if I was morbidly obese. That's it. Just, know, exactly. Just, so they would look. They'd look at me and go, um, "Can I, you take your own advice?" And yes, unfortunately, yeah. a lot of the practitioners you come in contact with will be obese and unhealthy. So mm. yeah, somewhere. Yeah, I mean, it's embarrassing. It's dietitians. Plenty of them out there, which I've seen, which are obese. You can't be, sorry, but you can't be in the NHS being, you know, and I, I don't want to upset anybody out, out there, but you cannot give advice when you're obese. And I'm talking about where the BMI is way above 30, mm -hmm. yeah, not just a little bit of tubbiness here. You know? And it's not just diet, as we know, you know, it's it comes down to self-care because there could be a thyroid condition going on, you know, there could be all sorts of mm. other causes, but yeah, self-care is important and it's mm, again, you know, do what you preach and... Um, yeah. I think that's a, one of the, this is not blowing my own trumpet, but having working in with the schools over the years, kids have always said to me, oh, do you work out? And I was like, yeah, I do, I have to take care of myself. I don't just go home and eat unhealthy. Mm -hmm. I'll eat all my vegetables if I can. Yeah. I'll make sure it's balanced. Mm -hmm. I'll yeah. go and train whenever I need to. So I'm not gonna go into a school and go, actually, no, I don't do anything. I just, mm -hmm. every now and then I do a bit of exercise. Mm -hmm. I eat my liquid diet, for example. <laughs> um, so you've got to be honest with them because that's going to help them motivate them in the future. That's the other thing, sorry, Chris. That's the other thing, you know, we were saying that, you know, getting school. Mm. I mean, when I was on the Hent Health and Wellbeing, one of the things I wanted to do was get all the schools together. So there's a head teacher, you can Google it on mm. Kent, I don't know whether it's Mason or whatever. So she, firstly, I think she banned fizzy drinks and then she banned Chris, but then she allowed Chris just on the Friday. Mm -hmm. And it was all in the news and it was in everything. And whilst one of the things, one thing I said, say, in Gravesend, if we just got every head, every school mm. to ban the fizzy drinks, right? Plus the, the Chris, and they can maybe have a treat on a Friday. Mm -hmm. That make a huge difference, and that's collective as a community. Mm -hmm. if some of the schools together. are doing it. Some of the yeah. schools, some of yeah. schools have actually done that with Christmas yeah. and, and chocolate, so they're yeah. looking at that um, quite well. Yeah. Um, and they've only had, for example, fish and chips on a Friday now, yeah. and uh, maybe a roast on a Wednesday, and then the majority of their crisp and chocolate, you're only allowed them once on a Friday yeah. as a treat. Like you said. But so we want some all the schools. schools to yeah, do. absolutely. No, we want that, not just like ten percent of them. Yeah, yeah. The more, the more that do, the easier it will be anyway. Yeah. Or mental again. Right, that's it. That's the end of our school. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed our chat today. Every single one of the uh, of my guests here will be. Um, I'll, I'll put their, their, their media, their social media pages, um, and, and the names, of course, um, below the post, so you can get in touch with them if ever you, if ever you need to. Um, thanks a lot for watching or listening and joining us, and I will speak to you next time. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers.